Right, so you've probably heard the phrase that renting is money down the toilet and you've been told your whole life from your parents, your family and your friends that you should get on the property ladder as soon as possible, buy a house because it's a great investment and property prices only will continue to rise. Now, some of you might actually be thinking about buying a house in 2023. After all, house prices in Australia are finally cooling off and you might actually be able to afford that dream house in the suburb that you've always been looking for. But on the other hand, mortgage interest rates have also more than doubled over the past few years, making it more and more expensive to actually service a loan. So perhaps it's not the best time to buy, but the alternative would be to continue renting. And if you're a renter right now, you'd know all about the rental prices that we're currently in. So then perhaps renting also isn't the best idea and we should just bite our tongues, buy a property and then fix that interest rates and not have to deal with rising rental prices. So should you buy or rent in the upcoming year of 2023? This is probably the biggest financial decision in most people's lives. And if you're wondering whether or not you should do this this year, you probably have even more question marks just given the state of the economic climate. So that's why in today's video, I'm gonna be walking you through a truly realistic example of a buy versus rent scenario. Now in this video, I'm essentially going to be comparing the scenarios of buying a house versus renting a house. And in both scenarios with any leftover savings we have, we're gonna put those savings and invest it into a broad diversified ETF portfolio. Now, whilst I am going to try and be as realistic as I can in this example, it's impossible to factor in all of the variables just because of the, the amount of variables there are out there. So just take that into mind. Now, before we get into the analysis, I firstly have to lay out all of the assumptions that we're gonna be working with. Now, I've actually created a spreadsheet, which I've linked down in the description box down below, where you can download it and actually play with it with your own numbers. Now, all the boxes highlighted in yellow are essentially the variables that you can input your own numbers and you can play around with. So firstly, the assumptions on the property side. So the property value is relatively self-explanatory. Now, I live in Melbourne and the median property value in, a, in Melbourne is around $750,000. So let's plug that number in. We'll assume the loan term is 30 years and the purchasing cost is essentially going to factor in, you know, all the other costs associated with buying a property like stamp duty, land tax and conveyancing fees. Now, depending on what state you're in, whether or not the property is for an investment or for your primary residence, this cost will fluctuate. But for the purposes of this analysis, I've assumed a 5%. And so this brings the total cost to around about $37,500. Now next is the interest rate of your home loan. Once again, a lot of different factors will determine your interest rate, but for this analysis, I'll assume 5% per annum, which is what I believe the current rates are for a principal and interest owner occupy a loan with features such as an offset account. Now next comes all the fees associated with home ownership. Now, if you're purchasing an apartment, there's gonna be some strata fees. Otherwise, there's things like council rates, you know, water fees, home and content insurance, etc. Now I've assumed a few different figures here, but you can go ahead and plug in your own figures if you want. All of these costs will essentially be kind of broken down into a monthly expenses that will then factor into our calculations. Now, capital appreciation is how much we can expect our property to increase in value over the next 30 years. And on average, you know, property in Australia has increased by 5%, around about 5% per annum. So that's what the figure that we're gonna use in this calculation as well. Now, there's also a section for you to make additional repayments. Now, I think that for most people out there who have a mortgage, they're gonna prioritize paying that mortgage down as quickly as possible. And so this is where you can kind of input those calculations. So I'll assume each year we contribute $500 per month on top of the minimum repayments that we'll be making each year. Now next, let's talk about the rental assumptions. Now I'm going to assume the weekly rent is going to be $500 a week because that's what I'm currently paying, but this could very much be you know more for you or less just depending on your situation. If you're a family, you obviously need a bigger place. I'm only renting a two bedroom apartment. So yeah, put in your own numbers here. Now tenant insurance, you know, you might not have this, you might have this. Um, personally, I pay $170 per year on this. So that's what I'm gonna put in. And then next the rental appreciation. Now this is essentially how much we expect the rent to increase by over the next 30 years as well, because we don't expect the rent to be the same 
in 10 or 20 years time. I'm currently doing my lease renewal right now and we're expecting to increase by $10 to $510 per week, which isn't so bad considering the current rental prices. I've had friends and I've read about people having their rents increased by hundreds of dollars, um, which is actually just insane. Now finally, some common assumptions that we will apply to both scenarios. Your initial savings is essentially your initial lump sum of money um, that you can either put towards your house deposit or immediately invest into the market. And I'll assume that we have enough for a 20% deposit for this scenario. So that equates to a total value of $187,000 $500. Your weekly savings is how much you expect to have each month in savings for both scenarios after taking into account all of your fixed costs and variable costs. Now it's important to note that in the renting scenario, this doesn't actually include how much rent you'll pay each week. But in the property scenario, your home loan repayments will be deducted from this amount. Now next, how much do you expect your salary to increase by each year? This number will really affect, you know, how much savings you have left over each year. Um, you know, hopefully everyone is expecting to, you know, progressively earn more money as they progress in their careers, at, you know, if at least at the minimum in line with inflation, otherwise, you know, you're actually gonna be earning less money in reality. And finally, how much do we expect our shares to return? Now on average, I'd say, a global diversified portfolio can return around 9%. So adjusted for inflation, you know, assuming we get to sometime in the future normal levels of inflation, let's just put it down as 7%. Right, so with all the inputs and assumptions plugged into the model, now we can actually go in and see how the model actually works. Now this might get a little detailed, so I'll try and slowly walk through the calculations to show you how this model actually works. So for option one, where we are going to buy a property and then invest any money we have left over. So we have a starting house value of $750,000. We have the principal amount of our home loan because we assumed a 20% deposit. Um, this means our home loan is effectively $600,000. Now, based on the interest rate of 5%, this means that our interest payments initially will be $2,500 a month with our minimum repayments, which is a combination of our interest and our principal being just over $3,200 a month. Now we can see in the model that over time, whilst the minimum repayments stay the same, the interest portion slowly decreases over time, which is what we would expect. Over time, you'll pay you know, less and less interest and more and more principal. We have a column to also take into consideration any extra repayments we make. So this is the $500 each month that we're making, which will essentially help us pay off the loan faster than the 30 years. The remaining principal column calculates how much of our principal loan we have left to pay off. And this takes into account all the previous repayments that we've made. Now the gross savings column is linked to our weekly savings number of $1,000 that we input earlier on in the video. This is just split out into a period of 12 months. So we'd expect to save, you know, $4,333 each month. We can see that this figure also increases in the second year to $4,420 because we've assumed that our salary will increase over time as well. Now the expense column takes into account all the expenses associated with owning a property that we talked about, you know, earlier on broken down into a monthly cost. So this will be your council rates, your insurance, uh, water fees, etc. And now your net savings is how much money you have left over to invest into the stock market after taking into account, you know, all of those fees and, and repayments that we've just talked about. And so this comes to $212 each month, which then flows into the investment column. And we then have a column that goes over the return we would get from that investment as well. Uh, and then a running total of our total investment portfolio. And finally, the total value column is essentially a combination of the equity that we've built up in the house and also our investment portfolio. So as we pay off more of our property, our property appreciates, our equity will actually grow. And as we invest more money into the stock market, our ETF portfolio will also grow as well. So that's how the model essentially works and it kind of essentially breaks that down month by month over the next 30 years. Now onto the calculations for option two where we are only renting and then investing any leftover money into the stock market. This one is actually much more simpler. So we have the rent that we'll be paying each month. 
Our gross savings, which you'll see is the same as the previous one. We have our expenses associated with renting and then our net savings. Now our net savings for the first month is going to be much higher because this also accounts for the savings we had for the 20% deposit. Um, and in the first month that all just gets invested into the stock market as a lump sum. Now, similar to the previous scenario, we can see our total investments, except you know this time this is only made up of our ETF portfolio. And so the model will essentially, for the next 30 years, take any leftover money, you know, after taking into account our rent and all our expenses, um, and then investing that into the portfolio, and we'll see our portfolio grow over time. Okay, so the moment that we have all been waiting for. So which option will be better for us in the long term? So can we get a drum roll, please? So the results say that option one after 30 years comes on top and our total net worth would be a little under $5 million whilst for option two, it would be around $4.4 million. So around about a 600K difference in terms of net worth over 30 years. Um, so around about 12% more if we were to buy a property and then invest that any leftover savings into the stock market. Now, most people don't actually stay in their houses for 30 years in reality. Um, you know, things change, you wanna downsize, you wanna upgrade. Um, so you'll probably, you know, most people in their lives do move homes more than once. So the model does actually break this down for you. So there is over the 30 years, you can see the net worth comparison and the growth. Um, and we actually, if we actually look at it, you know, the, the point where owning a house becomes more worth it over renting is around the sixth year. So essentially what the model is kind of saying is if you're planning to stay in your home for more than six years, you know, based on the assumptions that we're plugged in, it's better for you to actually purchase a home. Now, there's definitely some things missing from the model. Um, the model currently doesn't take into account interest fluctuations, which obviously in this current climate of rising interest rates would play a big part. It also doesn't take into account, you know, the cost of upkeeping your property as well, uh, which is also probably a big component, which I've missed as well. But, you know, I think it does give you a pretty comprehensive view, minus a few things of, you know, this whole buy versus rent analysis. Now, ultimately, no one can really tell you whether or not you should buy or rent a house. Well, probably one of the biggest financial decisions in your life, you should really be running the numbers and figuring out whether or not it makes sense for you financially to buy or rent a house. You should decide on when you buy and can you afford it. And you should also put in some parameters such that you don't stretch yourself out too much financially to the point where you're just gonna be worrying about your mortgage repayments. So that's all I had for you guys today. Hopefully you have found this video useful. If you did and you learned something new or it was beneficial for you, make sure you hit that like button down below. Subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And as always guys, I will see you in the next video.